The lazy person's guide to virtue. How many lazy people are here today? Put your hand up if you're lazy. I'm a lazy. <laughs> I am a lazy monk. <laughs> That's why I became a monk. It's just too hard to go to work in the morning. Or well, it's so much problem getting married. It's really hard paying the bills. <laughs> I don't know why more people don't become monks or nuns. Oh, just think, don't have to go to work on Monday morning. Don't have to worry about husband or husband suffering. Oh, there's just so much headache. Don't have, don't have to worry about your wife. Nang, 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 nang. I mentioned this to somebody because some of my disciples over in Western Australia, the one of them, he, he had a job in Saudi Arabia, he's an engineer. And he came to me and said he'd miss his wife because his wife had to stay back in Perth. He was going for about two months. And so he asked me, sort of, have you got any advice how I can't sort of I deal with my, my loneliness? Because I love my wife and uh, she's at home, I have to spend two months without her. So it's very easy. Get a, like a tape recorder, or an iPod will do, and get what we call a nagging tape. Record your wife and go, Husband, you must do this, you must do that, ba 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 I call it nagging tape. <laughs> so you can take it with you to Saudi Arabia. Whenever you miss your wife, nag, 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 <laughs> you, you can listen to her. <laughs> he wasn't homesick after that. <laughs> but the lazy person's guide to virtue. It's, well, the reason why people like the idea of laziness is because we all like an easy life. Don't you want an easy life with less stress, with less problems, with less difficulties, with less things to have to worry about? I like an easy life. That's why you know, these um, subjects I'm supposed to be talking about today. I know that when um, I was asked what the subjects for this um, enrichment camp, I was actually in the office in, in Perth and what am I going to talk about? And I thought, I feel lazy today, so that's the first one. I was very busy, so that's the second one. I was feeling a bit crazy, so that's the third one. But then I forgot all about this until about half an hour ago when people sort of gave it to me again. So I'm so lazy that I don't worry about what I'm going to do next. So I don't think about the future, only half an hour, and that's my preparation. Just reading the title and see what's going to happen. Why is it that we worry so much about the future? Can't you be lazy and let the future look after itself? When you don't worry about the future, it's being lazy, but you're also being very virtuous, very good, and being very peaceful. After all, as I mentioned later on today, when is the only time that you can affect your future? When is the only time you can do something about it? When is the only time you can be ineffective to build your future? Now. Now is the place where the future is made. So every time you start thinking of tomorrow, next week or next year, you are neglecting the future. People assume when they think and plan about the future, they're doing something about it, but actually you're neglecting the future when you don't put your attention in the present. This is where the future is made. So if you're somewhere else, you're not working effectively for your future. So actually being lazy and not worrying about the future, you are doing the very best to create a good future. When I just learn to live in the present moment, then the talk which comes out, it always comes out okay. This is an indication of what this morning's talk is all about. Sometimes people think that laziness is being stupid. But sometimes that we think too much, react too much, we don't know enough peace, and because we're so overactive, we end up creating too many problems in our world. And we're not virtuous when we worry too much about other things. So a lazy person is actually being an efficient person. An efficient person who knows how to use their body, speech and mind for the most happiness and peace. Another example. How many of you get angry? 
What do you get angry for? Oh, it takes up so much effort and energy to get angry. I'm too lazy to get angry. I just haven't got the time to get angry. <laughs> because anger, how much time does it take up when you're angry and having to fix it up again afterwards? Have you got that amount of time? How are you really busy people? I know that I've got lots of things to do. I'm sure you have many things to do as well. So when somebody calls you a pig, say, I'm sorry, I haven't got time to get angry. <laughs> when someone does the wrong thing about you, wow, why are you allowing that to spoil your day? Because you know it takes a lot of effort and energy to get angry. And it's effort and energy which could be better used elsewhere. Because anger is always ineffective. And when you get angry, all your virtue gets destroyed. You may think you're getting angry to get some result, but the only result which you get when you are angry is to destroy your own happiness. Ah, examples, heaps of examples of this. And the example which I, uh, I think gave yesterday morning, I fly an aircraft so often these days. I've got so many frequent flyer points, a few more, and they give me my own plane. <laughs> <laughs> but because you fly so often that sometimes, sometimes there's delay. Sometimes the aircraft doesn't leave on time. And one of the worst experiences of that was last year. About this time I was going doing a teaching tour of Indonesia. And when I turned up at the airport, it was Garuda flight. It was delayed for 24 hours. 24 hour flight delay. So when I went up to the counter, I said, what's going on? And so there's some sort of problem with the, with the engineering. Sorry, we can't get the plane today. So what did I say? I said, okay, that's fine. I can spend another day in my monastery. That's very nice. I don't have to teach that day. Hooray! Lazy monk wins again. <laughs> but the person that behind me, they came up and they were banging on the, on the counter, shouting at that poor lady behind her, you can't do this, this is not good enough, why does this happen, get me a plane right now. And they were shouting, getting angry, but you know, the plane never came early. All the shouting, all the anger, the only thing it did was make them have sore throat and sore fist. <laughs> Complete waste of time. And anyway, when I went back to my monastery, I thought, this could be expected, Garuda, because that was a time when they had bird flu, and Garuda's a bird. <laughs> so Garuda got bird flu in Indonesia. <laughs> it was sick. <laughs> so I made fun of it, and I told the people over in Indonesia, and they laughed because, yeah, Garuda got bird flu again. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no way that I'm going to allow nature, because it's nature that sometimes the aircraft, they don't work, sometimes you know, the car doesn't work, sometimes people don't sort of turn up on time. So what? That's life, that's nature. Why are you getting angry at things which you can't control anyway? Why not be lazy and don't allow any anger to come up? Oh, it's much more peaceful. You have more time, more freedom, less things to worry and think about. So being lazy is actually being smart. It means you're giving yourself more peace, more happiness, more freedom, more time. So being lazy actually is a positive thing. As far as thinking too much about these things, one of my favorite sayings, and this is a, a real Buddhist saying, I think this could have come from the Buddha, but uh, I never found it yet in the suttas. One of my favorite sayings for the modern world is, never do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight. <laughs> never do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> so why are we constantly doing things worrying about things, making things happen. Oh, 
I can't believe it that when sometimes people, my friends, tell me what they did when they went on holiday. This is supposed to be their holiday, the time for relaxing and taking it easy and being at peace. What do they do? So they go to, to, to Rome and they visit the Colosseum, they visit the art gallery, they go here, they go there. And when they tell me all the places they went, wow, that must have been really tiring. They say, yeah, we can't get, wait to get back home to, to relax. <laughs> and this is your holiday. And they say, well, look, why didn't you stay at home? You spent all that money getting a nice apartment or a nice house with a beautiful garden. And now you've got a week or two weeks to enjoy it. Why the first time that you can rest in your home, you run away? Wow, well, it's a crazy thing to do. Which is why that nowadays, some smart people, instead of going overseas or going um, on these uh, tours and package tours and seeing this and seeing that, if you want to see the Colosseum, you want to see the Great Wall of China, you know, if you want to see the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, get on the internet. Google it in, you can actually see it right in front of you, <laughs> from the comfort of your home. <laughs> Don't cost any money. <laughs> but, what a lot of people do for the holiday, they go to, to a meditation retreat. And they go and relax. It doesn't cost you any money. You don't have to go with all these clothes, because you wear simple clothes. You know what it's like going on holiday. You've got to get sort of an outfit for the morning, an outfit for the afternoon, your swimsuit, an outfit for going out in the evening. Wow, amazing just how much baggage people have to carry when they're going on holiday. But go on meditation retreat, no, a pair of whites and a chain, that's all you need. Nice and easy. So people go on these holidays no, to meditation retreat, like our retreat center we're building now, and they go there and they relax. And when they go home after, they go back to work afterwards, they really are relaxed and say it's the most wonderful holiday they've ever had. One or two weeks just sitting there relaxing the body, relaxing the mind, just making peace with all things, not having to worry about anything. Even their mobile phones, they don't work in my retreat center, it's too far away. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's well located. <laughs> That's marvelous. So you're at peace, which is why, which is why whenever we have a meditation retreat, we call it a holiday and we call the retreat center, you know what we call it? Club Med. It is Club Med, Club Meditation, and it really is relaxing because you don't have to do anything. And you know when people relax, and they don't think about too much, they don't worry about too much, when they're lazy enough to really give themselves some space and peace, they become much kinder, more virtuous people afterwards. A lot of the lack of virtue, a lot of the anger, the cruelty, the meanness, all comes because people are tired. They work so hard, they struggle so much, that their mind is just so bruised and painful, which is why they take it out on other people. They're so tired they can't see what's in their best interest. They can't see what's in the best interest of others. They lose their idea of wise compassion and they go around stealing or killing or anything else. But I know one, some people say, well what about like a recreation called fishing? Because that's relaxing. That's peaceful. And I don't know if anyone here goes fishing, but in Australia people love going fishing. So I remember a Buddhist came along to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, you know, all this virtue business, you know, it's okay, but can we make an exception for fishing? Because that relaxes me and it's nice and peaceful. I go out into beautiful nature have a wonderful time fishing. So I told them, okay, I will make an exception for you. As a Buddhist you can go fishing for peace. Because it's very calming and peaceful. But I told him, make it even more peaceful, more calm, by not putting a hook on the end of the line. <laughs> then you become real lazy fishermen. You 
because no one can see it because it's underneath the water and all your friends will think, oh just bad luck today, you haven't caught any fish. <laughs> but as far as you, you're sitting in there and you're enjoying the tranquility of the beautiful nature and the water and being with your friends and it's even more peaceful when you don't get disturbed by this fish yanking and demanding attention. So any of, <laughs> any of you like fishing, you're most welcome to go. Get a nice fishing rod, get a nice sort of seat to sit on, you know, get your, your wife or your partner to make you some sandwiches or some noodles, whatever you take, and sit there but don't put hook on the end of a line. And then you can really enjoy the tranquility and peace of fishing holiday. You can see that actually that a lot of people, they break precepts, they break their rules, they lack un um, unvirtuously, simply because they're stressed out. And because the reason they're stressed out is because they don't give themselves enough peace. And so that saying which I said a few moments ago, never do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight, that's actually profound. I don't mean being that lazy you become irresponsible. I'm saying you're too responsible, you're too worried, you're too controlling. And because you do too much, you don't have enough peace. And because you don't have enough peace, you too easily get angry and upset. When you get angry and upset, that's where your precepts and your virtue gets destroyed. So when we can give ourselves a little bit of peace, a little bit of freedom, when we relax, virtue becomes just so easy. And you find out why we have virtuous lifestyle. Every now and again people ask me to teach the youth. You know what it's like being a young girl, a young boy, you know, you want to go out and enjoy your, your company of your peers. But unfortunately that most times when these kids go out, they go out and, and people are offered drugs or alcohol and they can't have a party without it. And I tell them, look guys, girls, what are you taking the drugs and alcohol for? And I told them my experience. Now I wasn't always a monk, you know, when I was a young man, I used to go out with girls and go to clubs and but I noticed one thing, when I went to a party, the best part of the party were the last couple of hours. You know, when you're in a corner with your girlfriend, I won't tell what, what we did, but you know what we did. <laughs> <laughs> that was always the best part of the party. But I noticed, if I took alcohol or beer, I couldn't really remember that part, and the best part I missed. <laughs> so I tell young men, if you really want to enjoy a party, keep sober and then you remember everything and have a wonderful time. But when you're drunk you don't know what you're doing. Or even if you take a little bit of alcohol you don't know what you're doing. And if you take a little bit of alcohol you get into big trouble. Because people put their hand up they haven't heard me before. One of my favorite stories which I tell people to emphasize how important it is to keep your virtue and how it creates a lot of more peace and ease in your, in your time. You don't have so many problems when you keep virtue. And this was a true story which happened in, in Australia about 10-15 years ago. I did tell this here before and I was actually surprised because after I told it here in the BGF, someone was taking me up to Ippo and they had the radio on and actually it was repeated as like a joke by one of the radio commentators. It was a, like one of the weird, strange stories. It happened in Sydney. There was this man, he'd been to office party and had been drinking. Now usually you're not supposed to drive a car when you've been drinking because it's very easy to have accident. And the police in many countries, in Malaysia as well, they check up on you sometimes and they give you the breathalyzer, a tube you blow in which actually shows how much alcohol you've got in your breath and if you've got too much they give you a blood test, usually it means you have been drinking and you get quite heavily fined. Sometimes you lose your license if you're way over the limit. That happens in Malaysia too, doesn't it? But they were having a blitz in Sydney about drunk drivers. So this one evening when he was coming home from work, the police had, had got a, a, a trap set up. They blocked the road and they were testing every driver coming along that road for their alcohol level. And when he was coming in, he saw the road traffic block and he realized there was no escape. 
One of my friends, I'm sorry to say, he's a Buddhist, I'm embarrassed about him, he was drinking once and he got in one of these road traffic blocks and he did a U-turn. <laughs> Police car was waiting for him in the bushes and that was like an omission of guilt. <laughs> so he got into trouble for that one. So there's no way out, you can't do a U-turn. Once he was in that line, he just had to wait his turn. Realizing that once a policeman had tested his alcohol level, he'd be done for. He'd probably lose his license because he knew he was way over the limit. So it got to his turn. He got out of his car and the policeman approached him. Now that sometimes they do this to Buddhists. I remember being in a car and being driven somewhere and we got stopped. And the policeman asked, have you been drinking? And my driver said, yes. Blow into the tube, it's zero. What have you been drinking? Orange juice, tea. <laughs> Policeman wasn't amused. <laughs> but anyway, they asked him, have you been drinking? He said, yes. Blow into the tube, sir. And he was just being handed the tube when both of them heard the sound of a car crash. And they turned around, because it was a roadblock, one car had been driving slightly too fast and got into the rear of another car. The policeman heard that and said, Sir, it's more important that I deal with this road crash than test your alcohol level. Go back in your car and go home. And he thought, wow, must be my real lucky day. Because literally he came within about two seconds of getting caught. If it wasn't for that road accident, he would have been done for. So imagine that's, you know, you really feel, wow, I buy a lottery ticket today, that's my lucky day. But the story hadn't ended. The following morning, somebody, he woke up in bed with a big hangover, you know, what people get when they've been drinking. Somebody was ringing his doorbell, ding, 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 and they would not give up. So he got out of bed, got dressed, went to the door, and imagine you go to the door of your house and you see two policemen waiting outside. Oh, you were scared. But then he thought, the police can't do anything to me now because I'm not driving a car, even though I've still got alcohol in me. So he said, what do you want? And the two policemen said, sir, would you mind if we look inside your garage? He wondered what they wanted. He wasn't a burglar, he just had his car in the garage, that's all. So he said, yeah, sure. So he went to his garage and opened it up. And as soon as he opened his garage up, he almost fainted with shock. Because in his garage, it wasn't his car, there was a police car in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it, when they said, get in your car and go home. He was so drunk, he got in the wrong car. And he drove a police car. <laughs> Later that night, they were missing a car, they had a spare one there, and they soon figured out what went wrong. <laughs> I think he's still in jail. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're drunk. You do all sorts of silly things like driving a police car home <laughs> when it's not yours. <laughs> that's a true story. happened. <laughs> and that means a lot of problems and difficulties for you. So why not take it easy, have an easy life and just keep your precepts? I don't know how many of you have ever played outside of marriage or know someone who has committed adultery, had a mistress on the side. Never think that your partner won't find out. They know, especially, and it's usually the men has a small China girl on the outside. But these days it's amazing. When I was in Singapore last week, there was a couple of men came to me for counseling because their wife was playing with other men. <laughs> you know, that society's changed now. We've got equity between men and women. <laughs> so more problems. So it happens both ways. But look, it's just so much problem. Your wife will find out. You know one of the problems with men? One of the problems with men, as soon as they have lust, they go completely crazy. Now, as they say, all the energy goes downstairs and there's nothing left upstairs. <laughs> so they get stupid and crazy. And they always think they're in control and it will be okay, they're just having a bit of fun and their partner will never find out. In my experience, they always do find out. 
So never think you can get away with it. You don't. And when you get caught, oh, that's one of the biggest headaches of your life. So why not be lazy? Why do you want that headache for? Just leave it alone. It's much easier just having one wife. Having two wives is crazy. One wife is more than enough. That's why I became a monk. It was too much for me. <laughs> Having two wives, three wives, and it costs a lot of money. Having a mistress costs too much money. And if you've got, you know, costs too much money, you have to work harder. And you can't make so many donations to the BGF because, you know, the girlfriend gets some more. I've got a disciple over there. I've been looking after him for such a long time now. He's a very sweet guy. You know, he was, you know, his, his, uh, his uh, father actually went to jail. So, single mother, looking after these two children. And I was almost like their, you know, their, like their godfather. They always came to me and you know, I sort of was giving them some, some input in how to live their lives. I knew them since they were about 11 or 10. And they were all growing up and I would stick up for them in front of their mother because sometimes they're getting into a little bit of difficulty and trouble. And I would say, look, they're just growing up. You know, give them some space, they'll be fine. And especially this young man because he was having trouble in school. So. I talked with him and said, look, he's not happy at that school, can we move him to another school? And I talked his mother into moving to another school and he, he didn't do well there either. And he said, look, you know, just the school system doesn't fit me. And I said, well, you should go to you know, this other, like they call it TAFE in, in Western Australia, like tertiary education. You can still do your O-levels and A-levels or the equivalent over there, but in like a college where you're treated more as an adult. Send him there and he just blossomed there. Now he's got a place in University of Western Australia this year. His mother is so happy with him. Never thought his son would get to a good university. And I just you know, talked his mother into that over many years. So you know, I'm very close to this young guy. He looks upon me as like being like a grandfather. And so how's, how, how's it going now? He's going to go to university next month, but now he's actually working, getting some money together. But unfortunately, he's got a girlfriend. I said, how's it going? He said, oh, I used to have a lot of money in the bank, now I've got no money left. <laughs> and I said, that's what it's like, you know, when you're going out with people. It costs a lot of money running a girlfriend. And so he's got it in his mind now, if he does get married, one's enough. That's all he can afford. <laughs> so unless you really, really want to work really, really hard and try and hide all these things, it's much easier just being honest being faithful, and if you're going to get married, just having one, that's enough for goodness sake. So really, if you're a wise person, you're too lazy to have a mistress. You're too lazy to play around, because it's just too much pain, too much trouble, too much difficulty, too many problems in life. So this is another angle on why we should be virtuous, because it's more peaceful more easy to be virtuous, you don't have to work so hard, no many financial problems and worrying about getting caught. Oh, haven't you got enough to worry about already without worrying about those other things? And it's the same with stealing. If you steal something, sometimes you hear the sound of the siren outside your door. You think, oh, I'm going to get caught, and you find out it's only ambulance. <laughs> but still you get scared. Now one of the wonderful things about being a monk, every now and again, the policeman comes to the monastery. But because they come to the monastery, they usually come because you know, they want someone to give a talk or whatever. But sometimes when policemen come to the monastery, I some, see some people, they walk around the corner. They're afraid of policemen. If a policeman came to your house you know, tomorrow, would you be scared? If you've got good virtue, you're never scared, no matter what the policemen do. You know, we, once it was really exciting in our monastery, because we don't get much happens in a Buddhist monastery, but once one of these senior policemen came and he wanted to speak to me. And so, what do you want? He said, look, this is top secret. But, it's, I can say it now because it's many years ago, but actually next to our monastery, in a block of land next to the monastery, it's nothing to do with virtue, but it's good fun, there was the number one wanted criminal in Western Australia was hiding there. He'd robbed many banks and he was the leader of a gang. And he was hanging out right next to our monastery and they, they tracked him because they put one of these um, surveillance things under his girlfriend's car and they tracked him and he was right next door and they said, next few days we're going to take him out. And they're going to come with the tactical response force, like the SWAT team. And they wanted to use our monastery because we had a big war as a staging post. 
And I thought, wow, for a monk who never watches the movies and hasn't got any TV, this is the most exciting time. So yeah, sure. <laughs> well, the worst thing was they told me you can't tell any of the monks because it's supposed to be top secret. So I, I got all the monks together and said, look, something's going to happen in the next couple of days. I can't tell you what it is, but when it happens, get into your huts. And they said, come on, let us know. I said, I can't. But come on, you can tell us. <laughs> no, I can't. Oh, it's so difficult. It was very really good fun. And of course, a couple of days, I was sitting meditating. And what we heard actually was the helicopters. All these helicopters came swooping down, you know, with the big, the big um, lights underneath them, swooping down, up and down. But fortunately, they were so clever, they you know, all in their, right, in their gear with the guns and everything. Because this was one of the most dangerous criminals. But unfortunately, they could actually capture him without a shot being fired. But when after they, asked, they came to say thank you afterwards, it was a very, very well executed operation, so there was no violence needed. But they said, you know, you were very, very lucky. I said, why? Because that particular criminal, he'd shaved his head. <laughs> and they said, if he'd have come over the boundary into your land, we didn't know which one to arrest. <laughs> So it was very, very uncertain for a while. <laughs> so it was the biggest excitement we've ever had in our monastery, having the SWAT team come. <laughs> but when you've got lots of virtue, you're not afraid of the police, and the police aren't afraid of you. That's why the, the Buddha said, a person who is virtuous, they say they give the gift of fearlessness to other beings and also to yourself. Because when you are virtuous, no one's got anything to worry with you. Even I remember one occasion, now when we were very busy building our monastery, and the monks, we built the monastery. Many of, whenever you go to my monastery in, in Southern, even the main hall, the builder of that main hall, if you look on the building license, Ajahn Brahm, I built it because we were saving a lot of money, because we didn't want to waste any donations, and. We're fit and healthy, we can work out how to build things. So I was the builder of that and many other buildings. Did it ourselves. So, you know, we were you know, very good on this and uh, very good on building things. But I remember once going to the local hardware store to get some, um, I think, some wood. Now, the, I think it's the, uh, the laminated wood. No, and I had to look at the catalogue to find out what colour I was. And, and the shop was so busy that day. I had this big brochure and I was trying to open it up and find a place where I could put it down so I could have a look at it. And I don't know how this happened, there's other builders coming in, and I was moving this way and this way, and eventually I was actually behind the counter and I put the, the book down, it was actually on the, the till, you know, the cash register. And I must have pressed the right button because immediately I put the thing down, you know, the, the drawer came out with all the day's takings, thousands of dollars. And of course when the drawer comes out, there's a little ding, and as soon as I did that, and I was right behind it, all the builders there, they stopped and looked at me. To all intents and purposes, I was about to rob the store. Because <laughs> that's what it looked like, completely innocent. But I'd actually pressed something by mistake and all the, the cash register came out. And one of the builders saw the manager and said, you better watch that guy. <laughs> and the manager, because we'd known him for so many years, Whenever we made an order, he would actually send like, the bags of cement to our monastery you know, with uh, some, some buns as dana for the monks. Because you know, he understood about monks and he said, well, I want to make merit too. So he'd send some food down with cement bags. No extra charge. And he looked at me and said, that guy can't even touch the stuff. And he walked away without worrying at all about his day's takings. He trusted me so much. I could have actually just grabbed the money and gone. But he knew, Buddhist monk, can't even touch money, is the safest person in the world. <laughs> because of my virtue, he didn't need to worry at all. Just close the till when you're finished. <laughs> now it's wonderful when you've got so much trust that people will leave money there, their money, and they would I'd be absolutely certain that you wouldn't take even a cent of it. Now this is what we mean about giving fearlessness when you have virtue. 
And so people trust you over many, many years. And some of you have known me for many years, but in Australia they've known me for 25 years and they trust me so much because you know, you've built up that virtuous and trust and it's so easy people can relax in your presence. They don't have to worry about their money or their goods, about what you say you're going to do. That's like when here, when I say I'm going to come to Malaysia, I come. If I make a promise, I keep it. That's a level of virtue and it makes it so much more easy to deal with when you can trust somebody. That's what I mean that when you are, want to be lazy, you want to have an easy life, no problems, then keep virtue. It's common sense. So really you don't have to work hard to be virtuous. Just be lazy. Have a good time. Remember teaching a retreat. Teaching a retreat, this is one of the reasons why we're building our own retreat center because every time we've taught a retreat we have to hire premises. And the only premises we can usually hire are Christian premises. And so they always got these crucifixes on the wall there and, and it's not really the best image for people on a retreat having this crucifix there on a Buddhist retreat. <laughs> but nevertheless, I make use of it. I say that these retreats are silent retreats. You've got to keep noble silence on a retreat, you've done that before? And I tell people in the talks, the first talk which I give, say, you see those images of that person being crucified? That's what happened to the last person who broke noble silence on one of my retreats. <laughs> <laughs> That's your warning. <laughs> Only as a joke, of course. But I remember once waiting for someone to come in for an interview, and because it was a Catholic place, they had the church next door. And as I was waiting for the next person to come in for interview, I looked out of the window, and there was these two elderly gentlemen. They'd just been to church for the Sunday service, and they were shaking hands and saying goodbye to one another. And I heard their last words of their final parting. They, one said to the other, be good, and the other one said, no, that's no fun. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you guys are really stupid. Why is it that we feel that being good is no fun? That being naughty is more fun? You should be old enough and wise enough now to realize if you want to have a good time, then you have to be good. So, I mentioned this before, because I'm virtuous and good, I call myself a good time monk. <laughs> have a good time by being good. You have much more fun, much more freedom, much more time when you're virtuous. You have much more happiness as well being good. You know, in the long term, when you commit to your partner and you stay with them, you work it out together, you have much more happiness than if you throw them away and try to get a new model. Because one thing you find in life, all you girls who think of separating from your husband and getting a new one, you find they're all the same. Husbands are just husbands, that's all. If you think you've got a defective model, wait till the next one you get. Same with wives as well. You know, girls are girls are girls are girls. What do you expect? So if you think, oh, why did I choose her? I chose the wrong lady in my life. The real love of my life is somewhere else. Come on, get real. <laughs> She's good enough. <laughs> so stick with the one you've got. It's much easier in life. So be too lazy to get divorced. <laughs> and that's true. Many people have told me that. So you make the best with what you've got. So you keep your precepts, you keep virtuous. Virtue, the Buddha said, gives you the happiness called Anawajasukha, the blameless happiness. You look back on your day, on your life, what have I done wrong? Nothing. What have I done which have harmed or hurt someone else? Nothing. What have I done? Have I lied or cheated? No. That gives you an enormous amount of peace. It means that you've got no business to be done. Because whenever you make a mistake, you do something wrong, that increases your workload enormously when you have to fix up the mess afterwards. So if you're virtuous, 
You're good, you're peaceful, you're kind, you have less things to do. You've got more time, you're free, you're less stressed out. Don't know what you, isn't that what you want in life? To have no stress, to be peace, to be free. Virtuous is a path to freedom. Virtue is a path to happiness. So if you really want to have a good time, be good. All the wise people in this life, they say being good is not a difficult thing to do. Being bad creates the difficulties. Being bad creates the problems. Being g bad creates all of the <coughs> worries and concerns, having to hide it, having to confess it, having to make reparations and all this other stuff. It's much easier in life to be virtuous. Which is why if you really want an easy life, please be virtuous. There are no shortcuts to being happy. This is why the people like the Buddha, if there was a shortcut, he would have told it. Wise people, if I knew a shortcut to make you peaceful and happy, if I could give you a virtue pill, just keep this, <laughs> take this pill and then you sort of be enlightened. Wouldn't that be very easy? Just one pill and you wouldn't have to worry to come into the temple again. Unfortunately there's no shortcuts, but actually for those, I'm not sure how many, how many people here went to that concert in Singapore a week or two ago? Okay, there's only two, well, you, and upstairs. You, may, you heard this story which I told there, about someone who tried to do shortcut to go to heaven. He was a man from Ippo. And he's what we call Waisak Buddhist. You know what Waisak Buddhist means? Only go to temple on Waisak. One day, one day a year. So Waisak Buddhist. And he'd only go because his wife and children made him go. Because he was a businessman, you know how hard it is in business. He had a shop in Ippo and he tried to keep it open every day as much as he could because he had the shop, he might as well open it and sell goods to make money to get by. So he was a businessman who was really attached to his shop. So he didn't really have time to go to Tem. And anyway, when he went to Tem, he had to give donation. He didn't like giving donation, but he had to because everyone else did. <laughs> so he didn't like going anyway, but he went every year on Waysack. But on one Waysack day, he heard the monk give the sermon. And he was giving a sermon on what you have to do, what calm you have to do to go to heaven. And what he heard was this, the most important thing which will make you have a good rebirth or a bad rebirth is your last thoughts. The last thing in your mind before you die that is the most important. You've heard that before in Buddhism? And the monk continued, one of the best things to think about just before you die is the triple gem. The Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And if you think of the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha just before you die, you're certain to go to heaven. So this man thought, wow that's easy. I don't have to keep precepts, you know, I can sell things when they, I'd say that it does more than they actually really does do, or you know, it's more expensive than it you know, really should be. And I don't have to fill in the tax returns properly, I don't need to go in and donate, I don't need to keep five precepts, or go to the temple anymore. All I need to do is to make sure the end of my life, I think of Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, I go to heaven anyway. Easy. So he wanted to actually to be really, really easy way to get to heaven. But then he thought, well, how can I make sure that the last thought would be the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha? And he was a very intelligent man. He got this insight. The way to beat the system. Because he had three sons. So he decided, you can do this in Malaysia, he decided to change the name of his son, eldest son Buddha, middle son Dhamma, and the youngest son Sangha. Because he knew that when he was about to die, his children would be by his bedside. And he knew that's what he would see, his last vision before he died, he'd see his three sons, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. That way he'd be always thinking about Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha just before he died. Great plan. And it almost worked, because when he was very old, he was on his sick bed, and there was his three sons next to him, looking after his, their father, 
in the last minutes of his life. And he knew he was going to go to heaven because he kept looking at them, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Just waiting to die, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. But then suddenly an idea came into his head. Hang on, if Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, my three sons are here, who's looking after my shop? <laughs> and that's when he died. <laughs> You can't beat the system. <laughs> so the only way to prepare for your death is to know how to live your life. That's a profound saying. The best way to prepare for life is to know how... So the best way to prepare for death is to knowing how to live your life skillfully now. If you do it right now, when you die, you'll do it right as well. So the skillful way of making good karma, the lazy way, is to be virtuous, to be good. And anyway, you know, making good karma by giving donations, why not? I told this story, actually this is, this is science, this is evidence-based truth. There was, say, some sociologists and psychologists in the United States last year Notice an important thing, people are too rich, have too many problems. I don't know if you've read about people who have won millions in lotteries, and they were happy beforehand and afterwards they suffered so much. There's many articles in newspapers and magazines about them. People who have too much money are not happy. And we all know if you're very poor, you're not happy. So they thought, well maybe there must be some optimum salary, optimum amount of money for the highest happiness. And they did research to find out in the United States what's the best salary which gives you optimum happiness. Because they know too much means too many worries and concerns. Look at Bill Gates. Never has a day off in his life. Always has to work, watch the stock market, make sure his company is going okay and competing with other companies. Wealthy people have no peace. Poor people have no food. There must be an optimum. So they want to discover what's the optimum salary which gives you the most happiness. And they found in the United States was about 50,000 US a year. That was the best salary for the best happiness. If you earn more than that, your happiness level went down. Less than that, again, you could do better. When I heard that, I thought, wow, I know many of my disciples in Perth were actually earning more than the equivalent of 50,000. So I made an announcement one Friday night. I said, I know that many of you are earning more than $50,000 and the best amount of money to earn is $50,000 so I can help you become more happy. <laughs> Anything over $50,000 you can put in a donation box <laughs> and that way you'll be happier. <laughs> they didn't believe me. <laughs> But it's true, just the right amount of money, too much, you're not happy. Look at people who are wealthy, really wealthy. And sometimes I get to know these people. And they look at me without any money at all. And they envy me. Say, so, wow, you know, that I'm very, very rich, but you're so happy. You know, can we swap? <laughs> <laughs> but when you do give any donations. You know that makes you the happiest? Every time which I've given something, it's always made me so, so, so happy. When was the last time I told a story about the spider? Remember that one? I know the BGF needs a bit more funds for looking after their temple, so I'd like to tell this this story when I visit different temples or churches even to try and encourage people to to support these good organizations more. You know once, once upon a time there was a spider and this spider freshly born crawled into a corner of somebody's house to make its web. And it works so hard. Have you ever watched a spider making a web? Oh, it works so hard, it makes it so beautiful and, 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 
and well architectured. And when it worked for hour upon hour building its web, when it finished, it was such a beautiful web, and it sat in the middle waiting for its lunch, happy that it now had a home. But it only sat still for about 30 seconds and the owner of the house saw a spider web in the corner, got the broom and smashed it down. Imagine that was you. You built your first house, your first home, and you just finished decorating it and waiting for lunch and somebody come and smashed it to bits. Well, that's very hard. But the spider, never mind, I'll go next door. So he went to the next house in the row found a nice corner, built a web, and as soon as it was finished, before it found anything to eat, smash! The maid destroyed it. Went to the next house, and the next one afterwards. Nine houses it had gone to, and every time it had built its nice home, before it had anything to eat, someone destroyed it. When that happens to you nine times, you start to give up. This poor spider who had worked so hard and was so tired and so hungry, his web had never lasted long enough to have anything to eat. He started getting depressed. Unfortunately, we don't have spider council services. <laughs> so the spider was feeling so sad he decided, what's the point? Every time I build a house, someone destroys it. I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten for days. And he started crying. He was a depressed spider. He decided, what's the point? I'm going to commit suicide. He tried to crawl under somebody's shoe, but they kept walking too fast. He crossed the road, but the tires always missed him. <laughs> and there he was, the most miserable, suicidal spider that's ever walked the streets of PJ. Thin, sad, crying, and so dispirited. And there he was, trudging along in his tears, when he saw the fat, happy spider. There, just on the outside the door, was this big, fat, happy spider with a big smile on his face, enjoying the sunshine. And the big, fat, happy spider looked at the poor, miserable, suicidal spider, crying, and said, what's wrong with you? And suicidal spider said, life is so unfair. Every time I build a house, someone destroys it. I haven't eaten ever. People don't like me. It's terrible being a spider in PJ. <laughs> but then suicidal spider noticed something. He said, hey, you're fat and you're happy. Do you live here? He said, oh, I live here in that house up there. What? You mean no one destroys your web? No, I built my first web and it's still there. Where I live, no one disturbs me and I have plenty of food. Why didn't you come and stay with me? There's plenty of space for both of us and I can feed you, I've got compassion. And so the big, fat, compassionate, happy spider invited the suicidal spider to live with him. But suicidal spider said, hang on, well, where do you live then where no one disturbs you? And big, fat, happy spider said, Oh, I live in a place where no one has bothered me. Nothing disturbs me. It's the safest, most peaceful place in the whole world. Where's that? It's in the donation box of the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever disturbs you there. <laughs> See right in there, spiders. <laughs> <laughs> we use that story. <laughs> and that's why it's so compassionate to other spiders, because it always hears the Dhamma talks. Have you got that happy spider? <laughs> but it's a lot of joy and happiness to be kind, to be generous. So actually virtue is a quick way 
to being happy. And these days, I mean, I'm sure there's a case here with um, Malaysia as well. So many people these days are getting depressed. So much so that many counsellors deal with so many cases of depression. You know one of the wonderful cures of depression is actually doing social service. Just being kind, being generous. If you can't do it with funds, just volunteering. You know when you do volunteer work, service, you feel so good about yourself you get an instant source of energy which is completely opposite to depression. People feel depressed because they think they've got no self-worth, they're not useful. You go and do some service for any community or organization and you find that's even more potent and powerful than any drugs or any even counseling. Because you find that when you give to others when you're virtuous, you make good karma, you get instant happiness back. You feel good about yourself. Wow, I'm supporting this organization. I'm actually helping others. I'm being kind. You feel an uplift of your energies. Because of that, people who actually serve just do not get depressed. They get tired physically, but mentally they always get inspired. All these, you know how hard I work, Physically sometimes I get tired, but inspiration, I've got heaps of energy. And all these other people who work hard supporting my activities. And it's that when we did that concert in Singapore, I was just so impressed that these people working from 8 o'clock till 6 o'clock would rush to the theatre, do the training and perform, spend the whole weekend just serving others. They were exhausted, but so happy. And I knew that none of them would ever get depressed. So just being kind, making good karma, means you don't have to waste so much money and so much time going to the psychologists and the counsellors. They cost a lot of money and take up so much time. Can you afford the psychologists and psychiatrists? Can you... You know that book of mine, Open the Door of Your Heart? That's been translated into 13 languages now. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, a lady turned up from Switzerland. She had come all the way from Switzerland to Perth to say thank you for the book. She'd found a German edition, because in Switzerland, the Northern Swiss, they speak German. She was suffering from depression, anxiety attacks, was under counsellors and psychiatrists, spending a lot of money, taking so much medication. And she said when she came across that book, after a couple of weeks, she was released from her psychiatrist. You're fine, no worries, stop your medication. She got her life back. It was such an amazing journey for her, just what we call cognitive therapy, seeing things in a different way. That her depression, her anxiety, her troubles were completely overcome. She said she had to come and see the author and say thank you. So she flew all the way from Switzerland to Perth just to see me and fortunately I was there rather than being here in KL or Singapore or Thailand or somewhere. And she had a battered copy of the German edition. The German edition, they, they gave it the title from the, the story of the cow who cried. And when she asked me to autograph it, she cried. Saved a person's life. So goodness and virtue, imagine how that made me feel, how it makes me feel now. There's no way I could ever get depressed, the amount of good karma I've made. If you make good karma and serve, help other people, join societies, not just as a person who sits in the back, who comes on the committees and helps and looks after others, you will never need to go to psychologists for depression because you have this enormous source of self-esteem, self-worth. You are good because you've done good. Saves a lot of time being good, saves a lot of money, saves a lot of unhappiness, which is why if you really can't afford the time these days. So, now, 
Any questions about what I said there? And hopefully, from up, are you still up there? Can you bang on the floor upstairs? Yeah, still up there. Great, marvelous. <laughs> In the upper realms. Any questions from the upper realms? Please write them on a piece of paper. Send them down, and you get priority because you are higher beings. <laughs> but while we're waiting for the profound question from the heavenly beings up in the reading room. Are there any questions from you lower beings? <laughs> questions on virtue and good karma. And I just somebody was asking me about this just beforehand, about the karma. Karma is not fate. So I don't think, oh, I'm sick, I've got cancer, I'm going to die, it must be my karma. No one knows what the karma is. Like some people have told me, oh, it's not my karma to be a monk. So how do you know? Have you tried it yet? <laughs> I said, give it a try, then you might find out. But karma is one of those things which the Buddha said, only the Buddhas can truly and fully understand the law of karma. No other monk, not even the most enlightened monks, can understand it. Because it's just so complex, it's such a web of cause and effect. So I always give it the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't matter what you experience, if you've got a cancer, you know, if you sort of lost your job, if you can't find a partner, or you haven't had a baby yet and you really want a baby, don't say, oh, it's my karma that I can never have a kid. You can never know that. All you know is you haven't had a kid yet. If you haven't sort of found a partner yet and you want one, you haven't found one yet. If you're having difficulty in your marriage, you haven't found peace yet. If you're not enlightened, don't think, oh, I can't get enlightened, it's not my karma. You haven't got enlightened yet. So that means you're keeping the opportunity open for anything to happen. And that's a great thing about karma, that you can turn anything around. You are in complete control of your destiny if you put the effort into the now. You can change things around. So the most important thing about the law of karma is not what's happened to you. It's not what you're having to deal with. The law of karma is saying, what are you doing with what you've got? That is the law of karma. And you can always do something with what you've got. The old simile which I said here last time I was here. If you're going home and you tread in the dog poo, the dog shit, let's just use the vernacular. If you tread in dog shit, and as I said in Singapore, anyone who says monks should not say shit, look what the Buddha said. The Buddha said twice in the Vinaya and also in the Aranawibhanga Sutta, he said monks, you should teach the Dhamma in the local language. <laughs> That's what the Buddha said, so that I defend myself by what the Buddha said. So, you see it on TV, you say it to each other at home. So, you go home, and as you're going home, you tread in the dog shit, it goes all over your shoes. If you're a wise Buddhist, you never scrape the dog poo off your shoes. You always take it home with you. Because in a back garden, or even next door's garden, or public park, there'll be mango tree. So dig it under the mango tree. Save it. And one year later, those mangoes will be sweeter than ever. And when you eat that mango, the thing you should always remember is what you're really eating. <laughs> it's dog shit, but transformed into the most sweet, delicious, juicy mango. And I use that simile to say, it's what you do with what you've got. Even the most smelly, repulsive thing can be turned into the most juicy, delicious fruits. That's what karma is. So it doesn't matter what you have to deal with in life, a cancer, sort of your partner uh, messing around in a marriage, so if you lost a loved one, you lost your job, when things go wrong in life, 
when you're covered with dog shit, it's always fertilizer for the mango tree. Fertilizer for life. Law of karma means dig it in, transform it into compassion, wisdom and peace. You can do that. That's the law of karma. It's not what you have, it's what you're doing with it. Anyway, what would be your advice to someone who intends to renounce the world? I would say, Nike, just do it. <laughs> How many doctors have we got in Malaysia? How many nurses? How many businessmen? How many police? What profession is really lacking? Ma no, that's only half the profession. Nuns as well. And as I said the other day, the advice, actually this, this is, I mentioned this to the chief priest, the late Dr. K. Sri Dhammananda, and he thought it was very funny and he repeated it. In Malaysia, everybody is so happy when someone becomes a monk. You want to queue up to offer them robes. You're so delighted when someone becomes a monk, as long as it's not your son. <laughs> not my son, but someone else's son. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You want to offer robes and all sorts of things. But please remember, it has to be somebody's son. And if that's your son, or your daughter wants to renounce, you have immense wonderful karma to actually to give a son or a daughter to the, to the sasana. Not all monks and nuns become good teachers or become inspirations. If maybe only 10% or even 1% does, that's so wonderful. Because one monk, one nun can do so much good work for our society. Much more so than any doctor. So if anyone really wants to, oh please, we really need more monks and nuns in, in uh, Malaysia. And I, I'm lazy too, I don't want to always be coming to teach. Now you're supposed to get your own indigenous locals in instead of importing them from overseas. Now it's hard enough, you know, sort of teaching and uh, getting things going in Australia. But of course I'm very happy to come, but it would be wonderful. My dream for Malaysia is to be so many monks and nuns in this country that when I come I'm not really needed. There will be so many monks and nuns teaching and looking after you all. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And of course it gets very inspiring that it's your own homegrown product rather than some import. <laughs> so great, just do it. I'm sorry this question might be out of topic, I don't care. Do you think using martial arts is in line with Buddhism? Aha, as long as you don't hit me. <laughs> well, actually it happened once, you know. I was, <laughs> I was visiting my mother over in London and I was walking, because you know, I like exercise, from her apartment to the London Buddhist Vihara, this is Sri Lankan temple, it's about hey, three or four uh, kilometers, about an hour's walk. So it was a nice walk, so I was giving a talk there, I said, look, I'll walk there, you know, forget about getting lifts in cars. So I was walking, but I was walking past one of these very rough housing estates. It was you know, late in the, the afternoon, early evening, and there was a few, like a gang of boys were waiting outside. And there's no way past them, so I had to walk right through them. And as they saw me, you know, these were, could be violent kids. They're going, Buddha, 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 Buddha. So as I went past them, I made like martial arts posture. And they all went away, because they didn't know. <laughs> it worked. So if martial arts is done as, a, as, a, as a, what most people actually tell me, it's like a sort of a physical and mental training, it's a, a, a mental discipline, then that's obviously very useful. And I think most people who have done martial arts, they tell me that you know, really the best martial arts, arts people never need to, to actually to, to hurt anybody. No one, I think he's been here, remember Ajahn Karuniko, has he been here before? He's the second monk at Chithurst Monastery. I'm sure he's actually been through Kuala Lumpur. Yes. Now, tall one, tall English monk. He's such a soft, karuniko means like compassion. And no, he really is one of the most compassionate, softest monks I've ever known. 
He was, I think, second down in karate, black belt. And sometimes you never believe that such a kind, compassionate person could be such a skilled martial artist. But I don't, you, I don't know if he told you his story, why he became a monk. He said he was second down fighting another second down black belt. He was a girl. And there was obviously, this is really tough sort of martial arts in a competition. And he said something strange happened. He got into a strait of peace. He put all his defenses aside and let this second down black belt just hit him wherever she wanted. He said nothing hurt. He could feel no injury. He said it was a weird state of samadhi where he was completely invulnerable. She could do whatever she wanted, no bruises, no breaks, no pain. It was such a weird, unexpected state of mind he got into that he realized there's more to martial arts than just force. The power of the mind was immense. And through some strange samadhi meditation state while he was competing, he said no one could hurt him. He became invulnerable. I'm not sure in the martial arts manuals whether that's recorded, but I'm sure it probably is, as some high state where your mental and physical training get to such a level, you can open your body up to a second down black belt and be completely safe. And that started getting interested in the power of the mind, so he became a monk. As a student, I feel that I live a very fast-paced life. Every time I finish a task, I rush to complete the next task, and it, gets, it goes on and on. I feel the need to slow down, but do not know how to, how to. Please advise. Yeah the, next, yeah, the next session, the busy person's method of easy meditation is for you. But I will give you a taste, because being busy, I said this at a business conference, my definition of busyness is not having many things to do but doing too many things at the same time. That's a busy person who does too many things at the same time. Basically they become inefficient. And I say this because I've seen many people, they, they do a lot, their productivity is huge. They never seem to be working hard. They never stress out but they get so much done. Other people rush around backwards and forwards and at the end of the day you look about what they've achieved and it's very small. The busy people do not get much done. Doing too many things at the same time, you don't get anything done properly. You're inefficient. So when we talk about productivity, which is the word which is important here, if you're really going to be productive, you have to rest from time to time. When you rest from time to time, your brain recharges and you do become more efficient you get more done with less rushing around. I am very productive monk. I go many places, got many responsibilities, but I don't stress out. It's an example of how to be productive but with no busyness. And that, that's coming next. The Ajahn Brahm, formerly known as Peter Betts. Yeah, my mother still calls me that. Could you, because I say, of all the people, I did change my name by the proper way, not to Buddha Dharma Sangha, but to Bama Wangsa. But my mother still insists on calling me Peter. And I say that she's got the right to do that. No one else. <laughs> Could you please elaborate more on your earlier answer to your question, to be good is different from to do good? Oh, that's an interesting. Did I say that? But anyway, to be good is different than to do good. Okay, to be good and doing good, sometimes that we have a phrase now, the do-gooders, which is a lot of time that it's I think actually in the act of doing good rather than just, well I, th I think maybe let's rephrase that. When I went to that conference uh, over in um, UK last April, it's a human resources conference, I sat in at a few other people's presentations and one thing which was so Buddhist, I almost said sadhu. They were saying that in modern business, that too many businesses, they worry about just the outcomes rather than the process. 
as long as they get some profit, so as long as a contract gets signed, or as long as the figures go up, they will give you an increase in salary, maybe a promotion. But they found the expense of that outcome is that many people who were in that project got so burnt out, they left, they say, I can't stand this place any longer, you got stressed out, you got cancer, sure you got the contract signed, but what cost? And they said that in modern business terms, it's the process is more important than the outcome. The person who said this was a HR manager of DEFRA, which is the Department of was it Energy, Farming and Regional Affairs over in the British government. And she said that she managed to talk the minister eventually into promoting and rewarding the people in that organization who kept the process going well rather than got the, the contracts or the, the memorandum of understanding signed in Brussels and the European Union. So too many people were getting promoted just because they got things done but the expense of so many people. Now that department has changed. If you get the job done but many people leave as a result, you do not get a reward. But if you don't get the contract signed but people really tried hard, they were motivated and you got your resources there for the next negotiations, if the process is good, promoted. That's the difference between doing good and being good, not the outcomes. Like the same, like my, for example, my monastery. It's not whether we build it, but it's how it's built which is important. My meditation and retreat center. It's not just the buildings, it's how the buildings come together, how people get inspired. It's the method, it's more important than the results. So, sure, you know, we could sort of. Um, get that retreat center done, but in the wrong way and get this beautiful building, really expensive, but by exploiting or cheating others, that's no way to go. Sure, the outcome might be impressive, but the process was terrible all the way along. Same with the BGF. You're successful by just how many people like coming here, like serving on your committees, because the process is Buddhist not the outcome. Even if you can't pay your, your debts and the whole thing falls apart, if you've done it in the best Buddhist way, then you're successful. The so people are important, not the buildings, not the place. We're Buddhist first. That's why I tell my Buddhist society, we're Buddhist first. No, come on, Buddhists. Let's forgive each other, let's be kind to each other. Good example of that. A few years ago, uh, somebody gave a donation of I think $3,000 to our nuns monastery. We got a letter from them. They were in Bangkok, they'd lost their money, can they have their $3,000 back? And Now I have to serve on the committee as a spiritual advisor but I wanted to find out after all these years of teaching what my committee was, was like. So the president read out that letter. We got this request, somebody who gave $3,000 and they want it back again because they're penniless. And he said, according to our constitution, according to the law, we just can't do this. But, poor person is, needs the money, what do we think? And all my committee members, one after the other, said, well you can see the dilemma but isn't compassion why we're here in the first place? So our treasurer wrote $3,000 and sent it to them in Bangkok. I was so proud of my committee. After all those years, the person was more important than any money. That's what we're there for, to serve, be compassionate, be kind, be good. That's being good. Doing good is saying, no, we need your $3,000 because we need to build a monastery. So I think that's what I really mean. So process is more important, not the, the end result. You get a big, the most fabulous uh, Buddhist society in the whole of Malaysia. Big, beautiful buildings, but at what cost? What people cost? So be good. Don't just do good. Okay. Since you have been a teacher in school, can you share a tip on how I can encourage my children aged 10 and 7 to keep the precepts? Sadhu. Teach your children to be honest and to question. 
That was the piece of advice which somebody gave an English couple who were Buddhists but didn't want to indoctrinate their children. If you encourage your children to question, they say, why keep precepts? You should give them a good answer, for peace, for happiness. Why do you want to sort of steal? I remember a school group came many years ago to Perth and I had to teach them Buddhism and I just said, you know, what really hurts? What hurts you? Give me like a few things which hurts. They say like killing and punching and stealing and lying. So straight away you've got three precepts. And these were just kids who weren't Buddhists, who were Christians, maybe about 11 or 12. You know, what hurts? Kids are smart enough to know these things hurt. Maybe they may not know that alcohol hurts. But I remember going to, it was the, uh, a blessing of the manager of Thai Airways in Perth. He wanted to do a blessing, so I went there and I was trying to teach his kid. I said, have you ever seen anybody drunk? And he turned around and said, yeah, my dad. <laughs> great that way, really embarrassed the father. But you know, the father could do nothing because it was true. And then the kid realized because it's seen someone who was drunk, you know, that alcohol was bad. So if you want to teach your kid about what happens when people get drunk, what alcohol is, does, ask them, have you ever seen anyone who's drunk? Or even get a movie or something about someone who's drunk and show it to them. Is that what you want to be? Stupid like that? So that's how we can teach kids to understand the precepts is like doing bad things, things which hurt. You don't want to be hurt. What hurts? Don't hurt yourself, don't hurt others. And that's how you can encourage kids to keep precepts by not hurting each other. All along I am quite a lazy person and felt quite guilty about it, but after hearing your talk this morning I feel very happy and relieved. Thank you Ajahn. <laughs> On the board upstairs, I don't know who wrote that down, but I, I corrected it this morning. Somebody wrote down that it was the happy yana, Ajahn Brah meditation, uh, and they said, um, success comes before happiness. You got it the wrong way round. It's success comes after happiness. That was a result of a big experiment done in the United States, many universities. If you're happy, then you become successful. So if you feel guilty or you work too hard, and so you feel grumpy, you haven't got any happiness in life, you will never be successful. You be happy first, be kind to yourself, be compassionate, give yourself some break. From that happiness, you have all the success you ever wanted. As a monk, I was happy first, success came afterwards. So happiness comes first. If you want to be successful in life, create happiness in your life. Take it easy, don't feel angry and guilty, and then you'll become successful. How to deal with a person who is not virtuous? Run away, <laughs> associate with other people. There's always part of everybody who has some virtue. Even Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian. So everybody has some virtue in them. So if you're dealing with a person who is not virtuous, focus on that part of that person which you respect, which you like, which you value. And you will find that is the part which grows in them. That's what I did, I said, I think the other night when I went to prisons for many years teaching inmates, I would focus on that part of the rapist which was soft and forgiving and kind and gentle. I could always find that. Even some of the worst people. Now one of the most famous criminals I ever saw was a very famous English criminal, Ronnie Cray. Now the, now the Cray brothers, these were East End gangsters who like in England were just notorious for how mean and nasty and violent they were. I remember just visiting England, going to Broadmoor prison for the psychiatric insane uh, criminals and meeting Ronnie Cray. And he said, whenever I get a few quid I'll send some to your monastery. He wanted to make dana, even though he was a notorious, violent man. I could see something good and kind in those people. If you see something virtuous in the meanest and nastiest of people, they will see it in themselves. And that is the path to healing. Seeing the beautiful is like seeing the flower in the mess of weeds, 
so you don't need to destroy it anymore. You'd cultivate the flower, you neglect the weeds until the flowers take over your garden. Water flowers, never water weeds. Pay attention to goodness that grows in you and it grows in the person you're with. If you're in a partnership, a marriage relationship, if you always focus on the faults of your partner, there you go again, you stupid husband. You talk too much, wife, you never listen. Stop focusing on the negative in your relationship. You focus on, you know, of course they do talk too much, of course, you know, he does come home late. But I thank you so much for working so hard, thank you for being kind. If you accentuate the positive, that which grows more and more and more, the negative just withers and dies for lack of attention. Last question. Is social gambling during festive season considering breaking one of the five precepts? How many people played mahjong? <laughs> okay, did you win? <laughs> now festive gambling. You've got to be careful with gambling. It's actually not breaking the precepts, gambling. But the Buddha called it like a danger, so be careful. Because sometimes, you know what happens, people go gambling and they get addicted to it and it goes too far. That's why the monks, you know, we're not allowed to gamble, but I don't know if you know this story. This is of one of the famous nuns, Ayakema. Have you heard of Ayakema before? I don't know if you know this story, but she was teaching a retreat in England many years ago. And after finishing the retreat, her attendant, who I know very well from Australia, Anya Takta, her name is, her attendant was driving her from the retreat center to Heathrow Airport to take a plane, I think back to Germany rather than Australia. And on the way they had to stop for lunch, you now before midday, which reminds me I've got to stop soon. So in England, the usual the place they have for restaurants for lunch, they usually have little restaurants next to the pubs. So they have a section off you know, where they have the restaurant and it's next to the bar. And of course, you know, the nuns, monks can't go into the bars, but you know, the restaurant's fine. So they went into the restaurant and they had a nice lunch. And on the way out, I think um, Aya came, was just finishing off or going to the toilet. And the attendant walked out, and there's one of these slot machines, you know, where you pull the bar and all these things turn around, you know, to try and get the jackpot. And the reason this Buddhist attendant was putting the coins in the slot because they had changed, they were going overseas, it was just a way of getting rid of the change. You know, never expecting to win anything, just you know, had a few coins left, let's put them in the machine. But of course she was pulling it and nothing was happening. The chances of winning one of those machines is you know, zero just about. But then she put a coin in and she was about to pull the lever when Ayakema came out. And straight away, I got this from Anya's own mouth, uh, she said to, to Ayakema, now you're a Buddhist nun, you've got the good karma, you pull it. <laughs> and Aya came in a moment of heedlessness, she wasn't mindful, she said, okay, and she pulled the lever. Round it, round it went, and money started pouring out. <laughs> she got the jackpot. And this is careful being monks because you know you have got good karma. The only time she did this and the jackpot came out, but there was karmic consequences to about to come next. Because all this money started pouring, pouring out of the machine. And everyone in the pub went quiet. Because they saw this nun and won the jackpot. <laughs> and then the barman behind the bar got a bell and tinkled it. What does that mean? He said, according to our tradition, anyone who wins a jackpot has to buy a drink for everybody in the bar. <laughs> so a Buddhist nun had to buy alcohol for every person in this pub. <laughs> and that's a true story, it happened. So don't do that. Don't don't come to me and say, can you pull this machine? Can, can you give me some numbers? You get me into big trouble. <laughs> but if it's just for a bit of fun and games, and it really is just for you know, family custom, and you, know, you don't go gambling afterwards, no problem at all. And those people in Penang said, once a year, these, these old couple, they just go to Genting, 
just for a day. They take a certain amount of money and they know they're going to lose it and they just go there and just spend it, have an afternoon, a day together and they go back again. So it's basic, they're not really gambling because they don't expect to win anything. They're just entertaining. But if you expect to win and you want to win and you have to win, that's what I call the dangerous gambling. So if you get a certain amount of money, maybe 100 ringgit or I don't know, 200 ringgit, and you say, this is just a bit of end time, I'm going to lose this. Once I've lost it, fine, go out. Then that's not so much a problem. And say so you have to lose it. So if you do win, at the end of the day, give it to Temple. <laughs> so you just come out with nothing. 200 is what you're going to spend. Anything extra goes to Temple, to charity or something. And that way it's not real gambling, you don't get anything out of it. Okay, so thank you for those questions. A lazy person's guide to making good karma and coming after lunch is a busy person's method of easy meditation. So those of you who are busy, who have lots to do, who haven't got much time, the next session is for you. If you are busy, this is how to do meditation easily. No stress. So that's coming next. So thank you for listening so far. Do you want to do three sadhus? Sadhu. Okay, try again. Whenever you do sadhus, it's got to be with 100% with all of your heart and all of your mouth. So one is again. Sadhu. 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 Doesn't that make you feel happier? It does. It makes me feel happy. So whenever it is started, just give it really everything you've got, not your heart.